Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for another World of Pinot Noir Facebook Live. Um, we've really been off to a great start so far with our uh, virtual programming. And one of the things that makes World of Pinot Noir unique is that it really is the world. And in many ways, using Zoom and, and Facebook and Instagram Live and these platforms is allowing us to really live up to that international aspiration. Um, so today we're going to be talking about France and particularly when you're talking about French Pinot Noir, you're of course talking about Burgundy. So I can't think of a better way to spend an afternoon than talking about Burgundy and tasting a really exceptional bottle. Uh, so my name is Bonnie Graves and I'm on the board of Wappen and it's my pleasure to introduce today Mr. Mick Cameron, who is the uh, Western Division, Western Regional Manager for one of the biggest names in Burgundy, and that is, of course, Louis Latour, Maison Latour. So, uh, Mick, thank you so much for joining us today. And I thought I'd uh, just pass it off to you and let you tell us a little bit about the backstory of Latour, the very famous hill, and then maybe get into um, the actual bottle of Volnay that we'll be tasting together in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, it's a great pleasure to be here again. And Bonnie, thank you for the kind introduction. And certainly, uh, Louis Latour is one of the uh, most celebrated names in Burgundy and, and arguably one of the most celebrated regions in the world, as you said, for Pinot. A little bit about that, touch on some of the reasons why that is. But um, first of all, I'd like to say it's great to be back, I guess. I'll put that in quotes at the uh, World of Pinot Noir event. And uh, so we've, you know, always just had such a great time being there. I'm hoping I can uh, infuse you again with a little bit of the passion that we have for this spectacular region uh, via this platform. And uh, we've all had a chance to kind of intro this and say it's time to spring forward, right? We're getting close to uh, getting out of the woods here. So um, what I'd like to do today briefly is uh, talk to you just a little bit about the uh, spectacular region of Burgundy and through the lens, I guess, or should I say through the lens of the Louis Latour family, there's quite a footprint, historical footprint there. But I thought I'd start with this image because um, as Bonnie was just mentioning, this is the famous Hill of Corton. And uh, this is uh, one of the more iconic, uh, really uh, iconic landscapes of Burgundy, uh, part of now what is uh, one of the key uh, cornerstones of uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site designation uh, from 2014 historic chateau of the Latour family um, built in 1767 and then just behind that the estate winery uh, which was built in 1837. So um, the the winery is the only uh, such um, structure at the base of the hill of Corton built on an old Roman quarry. Of course when we talk about footprints there's quite a Roman footprint in, in this region and uh, it really uh, is, it was built in 1837. It's a five-story beautiful gravity flow facility. So that's the heart and soul, I always like to say, of the Latour universe, um, the footprint, the, the, the ownership on the, uh, the vineyards on the hill and this presence directly at the base of the winery. But we'll talk a little bit about the, the Latour family history first uh, and then discuss uh, briefly, kind of lay out the region, you know, it's geographical a sort of positioning and some of you will know that some of you will have been there and, and maybe even visited the hill of Corton or Lou Latour. Uh, and then of course uh, uh, just talk briefly about the varieties and a little bit of the the climate and geology and what makes these wines these two varieties of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay um, arguably the some of the most complex and, and long-lived uh, of any examples of these two varieties. So in the middle of the screen here you have uh, Lou Latour, Louis Fabrice Latour, uh, who is, as you can see, the seventh generation current owner and president. Uh, he's actually the 11th generation of the family of continuous ownership of over 220 years. So that's a very unique position, very European type of story, really, frankly. But he's the seventh Louis. So we always have to kind of make that distinction. Uh, the house again founded in 1797. Um, third largest landowner in Burgundy. A lot of people really don't know that. That shows the reach of this house and this family. Uh, owning more and producing more Grand Cru vineyards, uh, Grand Cru wines rather, owning more vineyards and producing more Grand Cru wines than anyone in Burgundy. And so, you know, when we think about that, it's it, just a, a, a brief snapshot of, you know, we talk about Burgundy and the classification, qualitative classification as a pyramid. So 
At the very top, the apex there, you have the Grand Cru wines. That's only 2% of the production of the region. And then right below that, we have the Premier Cru uh, uh, classification. That's only 10%. So those two all in uh, represent 12% of, of the production of this region. When you know, uh, those of you who know Burgundy, uh, understand that, that you know, the, 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 the coveted nature of these wines uh, and the limited production of these wines uh, is uh, when, you, when you know that the Grand Cru Premier Cru only represent 12%, you kind of get a sense of, 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 of what that's all about. Um, one of the other things that I think is really, really fascinating, and I put that uh, little picture here of the Coopers. I love these old vintage photos, the Cooperage. So, uh, barrel making, uh, barrel makers, I should say, since the first Latour set foot in the region in 1737 around the historical wine capital of Boone. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But the Cooperage is really important. There are other producers who are involved in Cooperage, but none of them own their own Cooperages outright. So that's a unique Latour component. And it certainly adds more dimension for, in, in terms of the sort of A to Z control of the production of the wines. And I often think about that, um, like uh, make an analogy with, with a chef who's gonna bring different key ingredients to a dish to elevate the entire thing, right? And, and the final sort of dish that, that hits the plate. Um, and, and, and he, yeah. Mr. Bonnie, I, I really wanted to hit home on that point because it is one of the most unique aspects of Latour that they have quality control from start to finish, most importantly with barrels. So as we all know, Burgundy can be to be fair, a little bit of a crapshoot. So I think one of the things that is so unique is that it's almost sort of, it's one of the most holistic producers in terms of having um, the strictest levels of quality control that are possible for a Burgundian. I mean, it's really impressive. So you guys not only have the grapes, the vineyards, but you also make your own barrels. So you can be certain that they're good barrels. You still there, Mick? Lost you there for a minute. You still there? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, great. The wonders of technology sometimes. I got so. you. I was just commenting. I think for a lot of um, Burgundy enthusiasts, the relationship between Cooperage and the oak and the fruit is one that's kind of baffling, right? So most winemakers have to go out there and, and establish a relationship with a cooper that they may or may not have access to the quality control of the wood. So that's one of the things that is really cool about Latour and just wanted to highlight that because it's so unique, not just that you have extraordinary Grand Cru and Premier Cru fruit that you're working with, but you make your own barrels, which means you know that they're good. So I think that's a really key distinction for consumers. It's very unique among Burgundian winemakers. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bonnie. You, I'm, you're, you, I'm still live here. You can see me. Uh, yeah, I got you. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, Great. good. So thank you for that. And, and uh, yeah, hopefully we won't have another in instance of that. No I just want to talk briefly. You can reshare. I didn't mean to interrupt. It was, I just thought that was such a cool point. And you can No, yeah, you, you covered that. And, and, you know, they do an extended amount of air drying the staves because there's plenty of ways as well, you know, to dry the planks. And I think a lot of that also, you know, again, there's the chef example. We're pulling out more uh, oak astringency uh, th from the wood and making, you know, really a, a very high quality uh, uh, wood barrel uh, uh, product before it's ever applied to each individual uh, wines, depending on their identities. And of course, when you have 220 years of this kind of experience, uh, you, you have a very, very distinct notion of exactly what each of these uh, wines is going to need. So uh, as far as the, uh, just to situate briefly, uh, you know, we have to the left, the uh, hexagon, l'hexagone, uh, which is uh, continental France. And you can see I've highlighted the Côte d'Or, the golden slope, Côte just meaning slope. Um, and to the left here, we have the five key regions of historic regions of Burgundy with, uh, with the Beaujolais region. I just put as a kind of a, it's not a side note as the region of some great wines there, but I won't spend much time on that at all. But we start up in the, in the Northeast there with Chablis. You're about two and a half hours South uh, East of Paris and uh, by car. Uh, and then we move into, that's the, the, the first, the more northernmost section, uh, district rather, of, of Burgundy. And, and for those of you who know Chablis, uh, true Chablis, we've had some sort of uh, modifications in the modern new world uh, around Chablis, but Chablis is uh, uh, famed for its 
stainless steel Chardonnay wines that are very bright, intense, very mineral driven. When you move just uh, uh, down one notch to, to the south, the Côte de Nuit, and also say in the same breath, the Côte de Bonne, those two, Côte again meaning slope, those two together comprise what is highlighted to the left of the Côte d'Or, the golden slope. Uh, and, and pardon me. Yeah. Could I, could I try you to share your screen again? I'm not seeing the map. You are not. Okay, so let me, yeah. sure. Let me I know it. that your point about Chablis is well taken too. Let's see, let's see if we can get back here. If, if not, don't worry about it. We can just keep going, but. Okay, so I, it says host has disabled the, the screen sharing, bit, but that's okay. Uh, okay. So, so basically, no, we're, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through it, Bonnie. Here. So basically, the, uh, the, the five regions, uh, Burgundy is comprised of five, five regions, two of the most famous being just north and around the, the uh, famous um, historical city of Dijon, and then just south of that, about an hour, the historical wine uh, capital of Bonn. So what you have to know as well, or some of you would, that these are Roman outposts. You know, these are uh, settlements that were established in the in the first century, roughly. So there's a rich, rich 2,000 plus year history in Burgundy. In fact, the first uh, one of the very first vineyards planted on the hill of Colton was the late seventh century. Uh, so that that again that bring, brings us back to that iconic uh, representation of the hill of, of, of Colton. So as uh, as we have these these five major districts, I'll I'll, I'll skip past the the Cote Chalonnaise with some great red and white wines, very clean, uh, beautiful wines there. And then the, 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 the bookend from Chablis in the north to the south is the Maconnet. Macon, uh, some of you will know that region as well. And you'll certainly know it if you do for the, for the uh, Puy Fuisse, which is the big gun. Uh, can be very complex white wines. Again, all stainless, still very clean and pure expression of the Chardonnay grape. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir was going to kind of take us uh, just briefly through the characteristics there. But we know that Chardonnay, in its manifestations throughout the world, uh, is stone fruit, pears, apples, peaches, citrus fruit, lovely white floral characteristics, et cetera, even pushing into the tropical and a warmer vintage, um, Bonnie, as we know. And then with Pinot Noir, of course, the gamut of, of lighter berry fruits, light cherry, uh, strawberry, into even richer, heartier style. I won't go as far as to say boysenberry, but those darker berry style fruits with a lot of earth notes, particularly in these cooler climate. Keeping in mind, we're about, we're in the northeastern section of France. I was gonna show you a beautiful photo of the, of the vineyards uh, uh, under, under a blanket of snow. Um, you have warm summers, but very, very cold winters. Bonnie, do you wanna jump in? And... Just that I think that people don't realize sometimes that you know a vineyard in Burgundy with beautiful snow blanket, it's a really kind of extreme place to try to ripen you know um, that's kind of a hot topic in general with Pinot Noir production is where's the ripening belt and it's kind of gradually creeping northward right where you get a really amazing German Pinot Noir all of a sudden you make sparkling wine on the south coast of Sussex you know where that band is kind of moving northward but I think that's one of the real challenges climactically and that's why Burgundy's history is so important is that they're they're able to make extraordinary wines even under incredibly difficult growing conditions you know that's really it's yeah. really hard to make world class Pinot in Burgundy it's really kind of easy to do it in California <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just, right. in, just in terms of the climate am I right I mean <laughs> it's a very difficult climate very very difficult climate and and you know what we refer to as continental for the most part so um, we have you know Atlantic influence in those swings again from very often very hot summers but as you say Bonnie a very cool uh, you know, hail, frost, all those things that can that can come into play along with the snow there. So, uh, Norman, almost as you mentioned, northernmost latitude for producing grapes, um, uh, you know, bar none. So, um, you know, and just one last note too on that. And climate, you've got climate, you've got the other terroir components of which there are many, but the geology. So, the, Burgundy is famed for limestone, and the, and the and the the vineyards themselves are limestone and clay based, in different variations from different eras, uh, geological eras. But one thing that limestone really brings, and every time I'm standing in front of you and, and sharing a glass with all of you at World of Pinot, uh, we talk about, you know, the how these wines really need to be unpacked. You know, that cool climate in that limestone uh, environment, particularly limestone giving aromatic intensity, but great structure and great shoulders. And, you know, a lot of these wines, in fact, what we showed last year, one of the top Grand Cru wines from Latour, Coton Vancé, 
uh, you know, every every person who left the Santa Barbara table or the Russian River table or the New Zealand Pinot table, I had to kind of really say, listen, there's a lot to unpack here. You know, you could throw this in your cellar for 30 years. So think about what you need to do to aerate this wine. And and by and large, you know, those wines, th that is the reason why you allow any variety. It could be Cabernet, it could be Pinot, it could be Chardonnay, whatever that happens to be in its cradle where the best terroir comes together. You let it go the length and the distance and it'll hit the sweet spot that will just sing in the glass. And Burgundy allows that for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because it brings together those climate and geological conditions uh, that give it all that beautiful structure. And then the clay there brings a lot of body weight. So let's, let's talk about, um, this is gonna be backwards. So it's gonna say Yanlov, but I'm sure it's, this is not a, uh, Azerbaijani uh, wine, it's Volnay. And <laughs> Volnay is the village and Enchevray, uh, there we go, perfect. And Enchevray is, uh, is the vineyard. And that is a Pommy Cru vineyard. And of course, you know, this village and, and Bonnie, maybe you wanna say a couple things about it as well, but it sits between two other famous villages in Burgundy, Pomar to the north and Meursault to the south. And what Meursault, as Volnay, the village itself, and the, a lot of the vineyards come right up against Meursault. You have a more uh, pronounced clay presence there, and you have more texture and earth, uh, or I should say texture, and a broader palate, really, expression uh, with, with, uh, with, with that situation and the geology there. Um, and Bonnie, please jump on it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, see, you know, I, was, I, think, I think one of the great obstacles towards um, the... Uh, sort of Pinot Noir enthusiast understanding Burgundy really is the label, you know, like they can understand no greatness question. in the glass, they can smell it and they get it and they understand complexity. But I think, um, I think that's still, you know, and you've, we've seen a couple of producers, we won't mention any names, but that they've kind of um, caved to the American desire to have the variety on the label, right? So you see so-and-so's Chardonnay and you're like, what? White Burgundy Chardonnay? Who knew? You know, so it's interesting <laughs> because right. traditionally, I really do think that that's been a little bit of a barrier uh, towards, let's say, um, introductory Burgundy uh, appreciation. So thank you for clarifying that, that Volnay is, hey, it's not a grape, it's a place and a beautiful place. And to your point also about the beautiful Premier Cru vineyard that you're sharing with us today, just that vineyard designation, you know, sometimes people think if it's Grand Cru, it must be bigger in size than the Premier Cru. And you're like, no, nah, not really, you know, really it's, it's, a, it's point, just yeah. understanding. When I've taught about Burgundy over the years, I often um, think of a pyramid, right? So we're talking about a pyramid of production with the largest base all the way up here to, you know, these finest Grand Cru vineyards and Premier Cru vineyards, but they're very tiny up on top. So I think again, um, you know, to this particular expression, it is um, it's really interesting since Marceau, we tend to think of um, for white wines, for Chardonnay, and yet Volnay really is literally a, a stone's throw away <laughs> when you get there literally. and you start walking around, you think, wow, these places are really quite tiny. And I think for Californian enthusiasts, they sometimes don't really get that, right? If you're in the Santa Lucia Highlands, you're nowhere near Sonoma. You're nowhere near. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> point. Here, yeah. the Appalachians are quite close. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's interesting when you bring it back to the California vineyards because, you know, when you look at, let's say, to, to maybe try to try to tune in here a little bit, you look at the Napa Valley, the production area there is about 30 miles long and about five miles wide. Um, Burgundy is roughly 40 miles long and about 1.3 miles wide. But Napa produces 7 million cases a year and Burgundy produces 1.6. Um, you know, the, even the average acreage is about 98, uh, let's call it 100 acres per winery in Napa and in Burgundy it's under 13. So, you know, you have a lot of those things that, like you said, you sent to the Highlands, you know, are nowhere near Sonoma, but these villages are tightly packed, a lot of producers producing there. And, and I always say, you know, Burgundy is complex. We know that. We've been talking about it for, for the past 20 minutes. What's not complex in, 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 from an understanding standpoint is the reds are almost exclusively Pinot Noir with very few exceptions. And the whites are almost exclusively Chardonnay. The rest of it, I usually say buckle up for the roller coaster ride, because if you really want to learn the, the distinctions and nuances between the Chardonnays and Pinot Noir and Burgundy, of which there are multitudes, then you know you dive deep. And I'll tell you, if you decided to dive deep in Burgundy, and there are a lot of great books, and I'm sure you, Bonnie, you can talk, and you guys talk about a little Pinot Noir. 
um, it, it, it becomes an incredible passion. And you're on this call and you participate here because you love Pinot Noir. Um, and there's nothing more rewarding than spending time with, with those books and learning more and more about the rich history and, and the distinction in these different districts. But this wine is, uh, you know, again, we talk about complexity. We talk about, you know, aromatic intensity that, of course, there's a lot of uh, limestone here. And it, it's not as if, you know, some, some areas are just pure clay and others are pure limestone. That's very, very rarely the case. But that limestone bringing such intense, pretty aromatics and you know, we always try to talk about the, the I love that from my old teaching uh, days, uh, the, uh, the word few, the acronym few, fruit, earth, wood, you know, and so it's an easy way to start out and say, well, here's the fruit I'm getting. And, you know, why is it even important that you try to identify, you know, things that resonate that are familiar to you, because you want to pair this with food. These are the quintessential style of wines to pair with food. So you're getting a lot of those really dark, and again, it's pushing into that almost woodsy, you know, wild berry kind of character for me on the nose, and and in quite a bit of, of earth tones, you know, a little bit of uh, I don't know if, if you know we talk about masculinity and femininity, maybe that's passe at this point, but the sort of you know men I guess tend to be uh, earthy and musty and and sauvage or animal, you know, as <laughs> leathery as the French say, and 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 women are all about aromatics in the in the sort of um, cliche wine world, but certainly we're getting a lot of kind of uh, over to fresh, fresh, don't want to get too geeky here, but you see a lot of those nice earth tones and a little bit more of, of that, 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 that slight gaminess. And, and sometimes I think we think gamey would be off-putting, but at the same time, all of these elements come together with the fruit being very present to create such lovely complexity in the wine. And, and, you know, we, we talk about fruit, we talk about earth, as far as wood, and we go back for just a minute to the cooperage, um, you know, Burgundians have never been about, and Bonnie, you know this full well, like I do, and a lot of you on the call would most likely as well, but Burgundians have never been about masking the beautiful raw material that comes out of their classified vineyards with too much wood, over-oaking their wines. So generally, we see about 35 to 40% new oak for eight to 10 months on a wine like this, which, again, as you said, with the the classification of the pyramid is just, it's the, it's the one notch down in terms of what, uh, that, how that pyramid's laid out and, and some of the most highly qualitative wines in the classification scheme. So, you know, you, you want these vineyards and Burgundy, we didn't talk about this, but I'll, I'll say it briefly. You know, Burgundy is almost unique in the world of wine. There are other examples for sure in, in Italy, Barolo and things like that in Germany in the Rhine, Rhine, Rhine Basin, Rhine Valley where the vineyards themselves are classified. Most often in the world, you have the district that is classified and somebody, particularly in the new world. So they might want to pull out a vineyard and say, this is from the Tokelon, not to single anybody out, great vineyards, but you know, in, in their own right. So you could pick any example you would like. In Burgundy, literally under French law, the plots of ground of land are classified. So you don't want, in fact, you don't want to get in the way of that fruit expression coming from that beautiful plot of land you want to do as much as you can to stay out of its way and shepherd it into the bottle. So the, the Burgundians are very, very judicious with their use of wood. And, you know, in, in a normal scenario, take almost any varietal from the new world, a, a, a wine that was, you know, only three years, three, four years in bottle, very often still has quite a bit of a highly pronounced uh, wood oak character on the nose that takes a, some time to blow off. And you don't really get that here for those reasons. Yeah, I wanted to mention if we didn't uh, articulate it enough that this is a 2015 vintage. Um, and it's really beautiful to your note about herbaceousness. I know like masculine and feminine with burgundy is kind of like, I don't know if, if that is so helpful anymore. But for me, this one is a really beautiful um, herbaceous kind of wood uh, forest quality, not from the oak. So not right. woody quality. Um, the major note I was getting was cinnamon stick, like cinnamon bark. It has this really pretty kind of uh, spicy quality with a little bit of that kind of um, bark uh, texture. But what you're not smelling is oak. And that, that to yeah. your point about the oak being so beautifully integrated, it's got a couple of years of bottle age now, but also it's, it's choosing to use oak sort of as, um, as a frame, but not as the, uh, backbone of the wine if I'm if I'm saying that well so to me like this is a really beautiful balanced wine with a lot to unpack uh, and I think there's still um, obviously lots and lots of years ahead 
in the aging of this wine, but it's really showing very beautifully right now. Yeah, I, it is. Could you still hear me? Because I think I've frozen again, sadly. Yes, I can hear you though. Uh -huh. oh, okay. At least I'm doing what I've been, you know, professionally pursuing for the last 30 years. So that's a good thing. With the, You're frozen in a good image. In a good image. There we go. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, there, that, that sentiment is a great call. That's, that's, it's a lovely soft spice, woodsy yeah. spice. And I, I was actually thinking uh, early of uh, kind of a, almost a, a soft black tea, black tea, yeah. black tea mm -hmm. component as well. But like yeah. a bergamot, bergamot, real bergamot. bergamot. That's yeah. a great, yeah, that's a great description yep, as well. I agree so, with tasting, I'm tasting the same things. And it all, you know, it all underscores again the complexity. But I would say, Bonnie, you know, again, when and we talked about limestone and cool climate and what that does to the structural uh, component here, and that brings such a great frame. I mean, we got a wine that's been in bottle for five years mm -hmm. with, with the lush fruit, lovely mid palate, very expressive mid palate. And such a great frame, uh, you know, in, in, that allows it to, I would say, kind of an etched, you know, very delineated frame and structure that allows this wine another, you know, seven, possibly 10 years, if not even more. Easy. So, and, and again, we talked about this earlier, this is what's going to give this wine the ability to express its complete identity if we let it get to that, that sweet yeah. spot. So. We know uh, in a lot of ways too, you know, these wines and, and maybe you can say a couple of things on that money, you know, how particularly Pinot Noir from Burgundy goes in these sort of funky stages and it'll close up and then it'll yeah. open back up and it'll close up. Yeah. And then, so talk, talk about that for a second, if you yeah. will. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that very thing because um, Burgundy, you mentioned a parallel to Barolo. For years, I've been wanting to put together a sort of um, side by side of um, aged Burgundy with some aged Nebbiolo from Barolo. But um, one of the things that's so unique is that they do kind of have a life arc. And not all wines are like that. In fact, most consumers don't realize that uh, in the American market, at least, we, they tend to release wines immediately uh, as opposed to hold on to them and wait and get some, some uh, bottle age on them. For me, this wine at, at, uh, at 2015, so what are we at, the six year mark, is actually still fairly austere and kind of angular. Um, beautiful acid lift, Be like you said in the mid palate, beautiful acid lift. All of that indicates that the wine has somewhere to go. It has somewhere to evolve towards and it's Absolutely. on its journey. A lot of Pinot Noir is not made like that. So one thing we didn't talk about yet is extraction. And I think that's kind of in as important as uh, talking about uh, soil composition, talking about limited oak barreling, um, but also, you know, extraction, like, so Burgundy is never going for like maximal inky dark color you know and there are Pinot Noir enthusiasts out there who like that style of wine we're not going to mention any big grocery store brands but man it sure smells a lot like Syrah in the glass when you get to that you know 15 percent Pinot Noir yeah, alcohol uh, new world style to me um it begins to lose its variety specificity so um this to me right now this beautiful wine again is the Enfant Gray the Premier Cru Vineyard is really um textbook Volnay, beautiful, kind of like lacy and angular, but with a lot of life ahead of it. So yeah, I think the wine is showing well right now, but I definitely think that it will have a lot more to show as it continues to evolve. And that's quite common with Burgundy, as you say, sometimes things will shut down in the bottle for a year or two. A good friend of mine is um, from the Gouge winemaking family, my girlfriend Francoise here in, in uh, uh, Santa Monica. And we've tasted a lot of, it's so interesting to have tasted some of those wines, which can be really muted in the exact same bottle, exact same vintage, exact same cellar, exact same aging conditions. And yet a particular bottle will be more expressive than another. Um, and that's really common with Burgundy. It's one of the, um, the mysteries of it. And one of the great pleasures of it is that when you revisit it, it has something different to say. Yeah, no, all, all, all great comments. And I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, uh, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier about the world of Pinot Noir and, and you know, uh, conversing with somebody who's just walked over from a Santa Barbara or, you know, some of these other lovely New World uh, vineyards with lush Ford, you know, very significantly more extracted fruit. This is a great example of what needs to be unpacked. And if you, you, you don't have the time, because 15 was such a beautiful vintage, had great fruit concentration we see here, but if you don't have the time to do that or, or don't choose to do that, then certainly, you know, you're going to be throwing a, a seared ahi, uh, a, you know, a meal against this or a, a grilled ribeye or portobello mushrooms or, you know, thing, things that will allow that, that, that acid and that structural component to really be sort of absorbed into, into the flesh of whatever it is your, your, your meal is about. 
uh, and allow the uh, allow the fruit to um, to really. I think I lost you again. <laughs> Sorry, Mick. Um, let me take up that point just briefly. How and where and the format in which we taste Pinot Noir. So at World of Pinot Noir, we have these big walk around tastings, which are a lot of fun. And it's one of the amazing values that we offer is that you can walk around and taste like 50 of the most amazing Pinot Noirs in the world. I mean, how great is that? However, it's hard to be thoughtful and it's hard for Burgundy to really show its best face in that format. Um, one thing we've always been proud of is our Burgundy seminar that we do every year. And that's an opportunity to really sit literally for 90 minutes with wines that have been sommelier appropriately, opened appropriately, poured appropriately, and watch those wines evolve even over the course of 90 minutes. Um, so I, 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 to your point, Mick, I think it's kind of hard sometimes to be at World of Pinot Noir where you've got a 15% Pinot Noir with maximal extraction, different clonal varieties, of course, different clonal materials that they're working with. So these, these more ethereal Pinot Noirs, um, they're, they're not meant to uh, play in that arena. And that's one of the things I love about them is because they're thoughtful wines and they require a level of, of engagement to appreciate them. So uh, we're at about 1235 and I think we're still recording, but I think I have lost my, my colleague, Mick, whose French is much better than mine. We talked about trying to do this in French. I'm like, I'm not gonna do this in French. I'll do it in English. My French is too rusty. Anyway, um, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But again, the wine that we were enjoying today is from uh, Maison Louis de Tour and it's a 2015, uh, beautiful wine from the village of Volnay. And the vineyard we've been enjoying is Yon Chauffray, which is a premier cru vineyard, one of the lovely ones. Um, and we're really grateful that uh, uh, Mick and his team were able to share this wine with us today and we really appreciate Burgundy always being such a big supporter of what we do at World of Pinot Noir and we look forward to sharing many great glasses of Burgundy in person again and soon. Thank you.